Gonzalez. Well, police departments across the country are coming under criticism for using excessive force against Occupy Wall Street protesters over the past two months. In Seattle, Mayor Mike McGinn apologized Wednesday, hours after an 84-year-old retired Seattle school teacher named Dorley Rainey was pepper sprayed in the face during a protest. Photographs of the woman moments after she was pepper sprayed went viral. One photograph shows the chemical irritant and liquid used to treat it dripping from her chin. According to Occupy Seattle organizers, a priest and a pregnant teenager were also pepper sprayed to, uh, that Tuesday night. Seattle police spokesman Jeff Capo defended the use of pepper spray, saying it is, quote, not age-specific, no more dangerous to someone who is 10 or someone who is 80. To talk more about what happened, Dorley Rainey is joining us right now from Seattle. She is 84 years old, a longtime Seattle resident and community activist. Uh, Dorley was born in Austria, moved to the United States in 1956 after working as a technical translator in the U.S. Army in Europe. She briefly campaigned to run for mayor in Seattle in 2009. Dorley Rainey, welcome to Democracy Now! Tell us what happened to you, why you were out in the streets, and how you ended up being pepper sprayed in the face. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Um, I am a member of Occupy Seattle. I spent uh, five days in D.C. with the October 2011 group, which was a wonderful thing to go to. And I hope to go to that group again in March. I got pepper sprayed because uh, we we were penned in by the motors by the uh, bicycle groups until there was no way out. And the minute the uh, people had us penned so tightly that we could barely move, they started letting loose with the pepper spray. And it was not just a few people that were targeted. When you look at the pictures, you will see that the pepper spray fog and the stream of pepper spray is all over. Uh, my problem is not only with police brutality, it is with the progressive getting worse attitude of the police. I was uh, tear gassed, and thank you, Norm Stamper in uh, Seattle, when the WTO was there in Seattle. And I also was in a workshop with Arundhati Roy when she was in Seattle for the WTO. These occasions, uh, while they were pretty violent outside, uh, were not nearly as bad as what we see now. It is getting progressively worse. Our freedoms are getting curtailed, and I just listened to the press being uh, banned at Wall Street. This in a country where we export our sort of democracy all over the world at gunpoint. And what we have to do is change the mindset of people that guns will not solve our crisis. Uh, the president going to Australia to introduce troops into Australia. I fear for Australians, because sooner or later they'll be occupied, like uh, our troops are occupying practically half of the world. Once the troops get there, there's no getting them out. I wanted to They're get your comment, Dorley, on the Seattle mayor, Mike McGinn, apologizing Wednesday to protesters who were pepper sprayed um, Tuesday night. He wrote in a statement, last night the police used pepper spray in two separate incidents. Many are now questioning whether the police use of force was appropriate to the circumstances. I have seen video, written descriptions of the incidents, uh, and to those engaged in peaceful protests, I'm sorry that you were pepper sprayed. Uh, mayor McGinn also wrote that he spoke to you, Dorley Rainey, and asked how how you're doing. Uh, can you describe that conversation and what you told Mayor McGinn? Uh, we spoke very briefly, um, and I told him that uh, he, he is not in charge of what is going on, that our politicians really have lost control, and this sort of uh, brutality is now endemic all over the United States and is being controlled by Homeland Security, by the FBI, 
and by the military and the uh, war on on uh, terrorism, and it has nothing to do any longer with what individual mayors may want or not want to do. Well, a number of questions have been raised about how much cities across the country have coordinated their actions against Occupy Wall Street. Oakland Mayor Jean Kwan recently admitted in an interview with the BBC that, that she and leaders participated in a conference call. I was recently on a conference call of 18 cities across the country who had the same situation where we had started as a political movement and a political encampment ended up being an encampment that was no longer in control of the people who started them. And what I think you're starting to see is that the Occupy movement is looking for more stability. I spent a lot of last week talking to peaceful demonstrators, ones who wanted to separate themselves in my city away from the anarchist groups who have been looking for a confrontation with the police. The conference calls were organized by the Police Executive Research Forum, a national police group. For discussion on policing and the Occupy Wall Street movement around the country, we're joined by two people. Chuck Wexler is the director of the Police Re Edu Executive Research Forum, and Norm Stamper is with us, the former police chief of Seattle, who recently wrote an article for The Nation magazine titled Paramilitary Policing from Seattle to Occupy Wall Street. Um, I want to start with Norm Stamper. Uh, because because you just may have heard Dorley say thank you, Norm Stamper, as she got pepper sprayed today, remembering what it was like in 1999 as well at the Battle of Seattle, uh, at the time when you were presiding over the police actions. Your thoughts today? Well, we made huge mistakes back in 1999, and I'm afraid they're being repeated today across the country, in Seattle, in Oakland, and in all other cities where there have been confrontations between the police uh, and members of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, well, Norm Stamper, in your article, you mentioned that you think that there are institutional problems, uh, structural problems in policing, that no matter who the political leaders are or what the, the top brass are, that uh, these problems can continue to crop up and appear to be getting worse. I, I certainly do believe that. I think the drug war, which has put police officers uh, against young people and poor people and people of color, the war on terrorism, the domestic dimensions of that war, uh, have all served to increase the militarization of America's police forces. And this is particularly tragic because prior to these developments, uh, we were on a path to create what I would call authentic partnerships with the community. That means no more unilateral decision making. It means, for example, today, police officers uh, and, and occupying movement leaders, uh, understanding the, the diffusion of that leadership, getting together and carving out rules of engagement, if you will, that will help protect public safety, public health, and also assure civil liberties, human rights, and some degree of social justice. As I said, we're also joined on the phone by Chuck Wexler, um, executive director of the Police Executive Research Forum that coordinated the conference call with mayors and police officials around the country. Um, can you talk about what's happening today, the Occupy Oakland, the massive police response, the kind of police response we saw in Seattle, um, with the pepper spraying of not only Dorley Rainey, but many other people directly in the face, the conversation that took place and why you coordinated this call, Chuck? Well, yeah, good morning. Um, but first of all, correction, we did not coordinate the call with the mayors. It was simply with police chiefs, and um, it originated from uh, Boston and Portland. The police chiefs in those cities asked to just compare notes. You know, I, I think, um, you know, this movement has uh, evolved uh, since it started. It was very, you know, relatively peaceful. And quite frankly, I think a lot of the police officers had a lot in common with, uh, you know, the demonstrators in terms of the concerns about the economy and working class people and so forth. Um, but I think, you know, over time in some cities, 
the nature of uh, the demonstration has changed. And, and and but it's hard to talk about it, you know, all over the United States because I think you probably have, you know, it's very idiosyncratic depending upon the city, depending upon the nature of who's involved. But uh, in some cities, um, it has that the the hand of the police has been forced by, you know, either violence or uh, the, the changing nature of what's been happening on the ground. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't have the details about Oakland and, and Seattle and so forth. I can just tell you, um, and I know Norm Stamper would, would agree, at least in, insofar as we learned a lot from what happened in Seattle uh, when he was chief up there about handling demonstrators. And I think the police are far more um, careful about not wanting to be drawn into something that it really has nothing to do with them and really trying to, as much as they can to exercise restraint, to use intermediaries, to, to reach out to the leaders of of these uh, occupied movements, the challenge is there aren't really any leaders, or if there are leaders, they don't want to be leaders. So um, it's difficult to know who's responsible, who's in charge. But I think, you know, the police today are far more careful about exercising restraint. I mean, by and large, I mean, you have 17,000 police agencies in the country. So, you know, it's hard to make generalizations. But I do think that, you know, when the first Occupy Wall Street, Street movement started and, and police saw what happened uh, on the bridge and so forth and the, and the police sort of getting drawn into that. There's been really a reluctance on the part of the police, you know, to want to move uh, unless absolutely necessary. And so I think the political structure within these cities has played a big role in ter determining what kind of action the police are going to take. Norm Stamper, your response. Well, I, I, I have great respect for Chuck, and, and I do believe that since 1999 and, and the battle in Seattle, uh, there have been many changes. My concern is many of those changes have been for the worse. Uh, the officers, for example, in Oakland were dressed as my police officers were in Seattle, which is, in effect, for full, in full battle gear. Uh, we were using military tactics. Uh, I authorized uh, the use of chemical agents on nonviolent offenders. I thought I had good justification at that time. I did not. The police officer in me was thinking about emergency vehicles, fire trucks, aid cars being able to get through a key intersection. The, the police chief in me should have said, this is wrong and vetoed that decision. Uh, I, I will regret that decision for the rest of my life. We took a military response to a situation that was fundamentally nonviolent, in which Americans were expressing their views and their values and used tear gas on them, and that was just plain wrong. Oh, well, uh, Chuck Wexler, I'd like to ask you about that, not only about this issue of the increased militarization, uh, also that there have been other cities where law enforcement has taken a very different uh, approach. In Philadelphia, in Albany, the district attorney is refusing to uh, declining to prosecute uh, cases of arrests of people who are being arrested for being in a park, uh, but also the way that the uh, some of the police forces are dealing with the press and of the—because the press are supposed to be there to be able able to be the eyes and ears of the public uh, in these events, but increasingly you're getting reporters arrested, uh, removed, uh, not allowed to be at the at the, the biggest flashpoints or to be able to uh, to uh, take photos or to uh, to take camera shots of them. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you know, uh, it, it's it, you, it's the police response is going to vary uh, from from city to city, but let me let me just kind of back up a little bit and, and respond to what Norm said. You know, we, you know, and I have a lot of respect for Norm Stamper, too. Uh, we learned a lot. He's very forthcoming with what went right and what went wrong uh, with the battle for Seattle, if you will. But, you know, um, in fairness, uh, the, you know, you were faced, Norm, with a, in a very difficult situation. And in fact, there really hadn't been many demonstrations up till Seattle. I mean, prior to the Vietnam era, there was a big lag time. And But what, what was, what, what does happen in some of these events is you can have 
90 percent of the people are there peacefully and you have this small contingent and i think i think norm what you had in seattle is you had this this group of anarchists that somehow was able to cause such disturbances that that it forced a reaction that perhaps was was an overreaction but i don't think the police were prepared for it and today you know the police struggle between these two extremes between people who go to exercise the first amendment rights and then people who are there to cause you know damage and destruction so norm sanford respond to that issue um why you still think um you were wrong that you're taking issue with chuck wexler here that given the situation 1999 you now say you did the absolutely wrong thing well, for five years after I retired, I, re I remember being on book tour and having people come up to me and say, I was on the streets and I got to tell you, I was shocked at the behavior of the police. And I asked them about what was particularly shocking about the behavior, and it all came back to me. It came back to my authoriz uh, authorization of the use of chemical agents, a euphemism for tear gas or pepper spray, and the effect that that had uh, from that moment on and throughout the week. It's, there's no question but what uh, anarchists, by definition, uh, or for that matter, even recreational rioters who are simply sitting in a bar and see the action and get attracted to the downtown area, we had some of that, uh, can, can help distract attention away from the cause itself uh, and create major public safety issues for the police. Here's my point. If the police and the community in a democratic society are really working hard, and it is hard work, to forge authentic partnerships rather than this uh, unilateral paramilitary response to these demonstrations, that the relationship itself serves as a shock absorber. Picture police officers helping to protect uh, the, the demonstrators. Picture demonstrators saying, we see people uh, on the fringes, for example, who are essentially undemocratic in their tactics. And so we need to work together to resolve that issue. Uh, these resolutions are clearly not easy. But one of the things that complicates the picture enormously is when a woman like Ms. Rainey uh, is pepper sprayed. When innocent people who are there to protest what I consider to be very legitimate grievances uh, against corporate America, against a government that has, in many respects, been bought off by corporations, the police have a responsibility to be neutral. It should be apparent that I'm not neutral, uh, but I'm no longer a cop. And police to, officers to... on the streets really do need to be uh, neutral referees, and they need the help. Uh, of their civilian, if I may use that term, partners. Speaking of neutral referees, I wanted to bring a judge into this discussion. Um, retired New York Supreme Court Judge Karen Smith, who worked as a legal observer early Tuesday morning here in New York. I saw her right on the corner of Wall Street shortly after police raided the Occupy Wall Street encampment. Judge Smith, what did you see? Well, I arrived about 1.30, 1.40 in the morning, uh, got out and walked to Day and uh, Broadway. And the police were in full riot gear. I mean, it, it was a paramilitary operation, if there ever was one. I mean, which sets up. Here it is, 1.30 in the morning, what we call a stealth eviction, 1.30 in the morning, and they were just lined up two blocks from on either side, uh, from the park, so that nobody could get near. With this solid wall of police, I was wearing—and then I brought this, a hat, which says the National uh, Lawyers Guild Legal Observer. And as you can see in color, it's quite bright. And it's at night— It's fluorescent green. It's fluorescent green. And then I was wearing it, and I had a pad and a pen, and I was there to take down the names of people who were arrested so we could follow them through the system and just observe what was going on. And as I'm standing there, um, some African-American woman goes up to a police officer and says, uh, I need to get in. My daughter's there. I want to know if she's OK. And he said, move on, lady. And he kept pushing. They kept pushing with their sticks, pushing back. And she said, and she was crying. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she, he throws her to the ground and starts hitting her in the head. And I walk over and I say, 
look, cuff her if she's done something, but you don't need to do that. And he said, lady, do you want to get arrested? And I said, do you see my hat? I'm here as a legal observer. He said, you want to get arrested? And he pushed me up against the wall. And, you know, it, it was late at night. There was a lot going on. People were—all of a sudden, there was, like, a quadrant of police pushing everybody into Day Street between Broadway and Church. And it seemed like they were setting everybody up to get arrested. And then they started—some people broke away, some of the police, and started running after people. Um, I moved away and uh, then decided that I needed to get on the other side. I got, received a call that there was things that were developing on Pine and Broadway. And so I moved all the way east to go around the police and then ended up on Pine and Broadway, which is really where I ran into you. And, and uh, of course, you had a, a, a personal interest as well. Your son was also one of the one of the participants in, in Occupy Wall yes, Street. My, my son was a uh, he's a staff person for SEIU 1199, and they were there in support. They were not going to get arrested, but they wanted to show the demonstrators and the uh, occupiers that, and they've been supportive all along as one of the unions. And he was there, and I was watching carefully <laughs> to make sure that he did not uh, get hurt as well. I was very concerned. Uh, at Pine and Broadway, it was sort of a standoff. Uh, people weren't—there was a lot of confusion. People didn't know what was going on. There were some people that may have sat on some police cars just in comfort, but nobody was—I heard later on reports talk about objectivity of the press, you know, that they were jumping up and down and they were taunting the police. The only time I ever saw it on when I first got there on Day and Broadway, they were just saying, shame on you, uh, you know, to the police. and. But that was it. And down on Pine and Broadway, at least until about 4.30 in the morning, I didn't see any provocation whatsoever. We're going to lose the satellite for Dorley, yeah. uh, for Dorley Rainey in Seattle. But I wanted to ask you, Dorley, what did it feel like to be pepper sprayed in the face, this dramatic photograph of you being helped by two people um, uh, right afterwards? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it's very painful. Uh, and when they say there are no after effects, I still have a pain in my lungs, and my voice is uh, kind of raspy. Uh, I don't know how long that will last. But the thing really is not about me getting pepper sprayed. It is a much bigger issue than that, and I would like everybody to keep that in mind, that while we're getting pepper sprayed, other issues are not being heard. And that's my problem. I, I, I feel issues become a major focus to the detriment of the real issues that cause this whole problem. And uh, I'd like to ask Chuck Wexler, uh, the, this a whole issue of uh, the police chiefs trying to uh, exchange information, was there any involvement of the uh, of Department of Homeland Security or the, uh, or the uh, federal officials in the discussions with the various uh, police chiefs? Uh, not, 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 on our, not on our conference call at all. But, uh, you know, if I can just— uh Say a few things just in response to the, the last uh, conversations. You know, this is this is really the struggle that the police have. And this is why, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think uh, what Norm was saying about you know the partnerships and, and intermediaries and, and communication is so important because you know this is a no-win situation for the police. They, you know, and and one of the things we've learned out of the '60s and out of the you know Chicago Democratic Convention and all the ways and uh, from the South and all of the the ways the police have had to handle these kind of situations is you know a minimum amount a, a use of restraint and and I think that's the real challenge here the police don't want to be in this situation and whatever you can do to have intermediaries uh, like the judge whatever be the, the 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 people that are intervening rather than the police I think it's a real it's a it's a no win situation for most police departments. They have worked really hard to develop partnerships with the community, the community policing, all of those things. And sometimes you have one officer that does something, forgive me, stupid, and it you know, it characterizes the entire police force. But I think, you know, if you look at the restraint that police use today versus what they used ten, twenty, thirty years ago, it's it's substantially less 
use of force. But there's still mistakes, and there's still, you know, officers that are going to act inappropriately. Chuck I Wexler, think um, in New York, I mean, we saw a massive phalanx of police moving in. In the area where the judge was just describing, the police forced everyone out of the street onto the sidewalk and said, just get on the sidewalk. They were screaming to everyone, get on the sidewalk. Soon as people got on the sidewalk, they rushed them on the sidewalk up against the um, up against the rails along the sidewalk. But I did want to ask you, how involved is FBI and Homeland Security in these discussions, Chuck Wexler? We, we haven't had — they haven't been involved. They, maybe they were involved at the local level, but nationally, at least on our conference calls, I don't think they didn't have a role. There, there were some press reports that uh, there were Homeland Security uh, presentations uh, urging that these arrests be conducted late at night. We that may have been done at the city level. It wasn't on our conference calls. We had that, no one from, uh, you know, Homeland Security made that kind of presentation. Nor, you know, we we were really we were just comparing notes. We were like, how are different cities trying to deal with this uh, in the most civil way possible? You know, what are some of the strategies? And some cities, for example, they didn't have the police directly involved. They had, you know, uh, the sanitation people and, and health and human services and folks like that uh, on the front end. Um, and that was interesting. Because why, I mean, at the end of the day, why are the police the ones that, that own this issue? I mean, because the police really don't want to be the ones you know, dismantling uh, these encampments. But, you know, why is it, if you ask, you should ask cities, why, why do we put the police in these, in these areas? Because, you know, at the end of the day, people feel as though you need some kind of legal authority or someone who's going to come in. But trust me, the police do not want to be put in this position, and cities really need to ask themselves, is there another way to handle this, you know, this kind of conflict? Uh, and, uh, Karen Smith, uh, you retired in 2010 as a Supreme Court judge, so you, you obviously have dealt uh, over many years with, uh, with uh, p the police department and police officials. Your sense, uh, when, you, when we spoke a couple of days ago, and uh, you also talked about the, your sense that there was a really hostile or tense uh, uh, situation from the very beginning with the, how the police uh, were responding to the protesters. Could you talk about that? Yes, well, I, I don't know if it, Mr. Stanford was the one who said this, but I think it was structural. You, 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 at night, one o'clock in the morning, people dressed in riot gear. There were trucks, remember, lined up with for the sanitation to just throw people's things in, computers and everything. And now people, I'm told, they can't get the stuff. There was a them and us. I. Having worked with police officers for years, there are very, I agree that there are very good ones. It's not individuals. It is a system that's being set up of us and them. And the other thing that needs to be brought out, and I think it was in the court case in front of Judge Stallman, who was a colleague of mine, is how often do you get the police and the state enforcing private property rights? Uh, the contradictions are tremendous, just that. I mean, as you pointed out in your article I read, and, some, and also even uh, <laughs> David Letterman last night, on, you know, points out, you know, it's okay for prostitutes, drug dealers, and now we're having our Christmas fair where they're putting up tents, you know, but that's for profit. So that's okay. Well, well explain that, because maybe people in other oh, parts of the country Christmas don't understand. at Christmas time in New York and I think around the country, there are these little craft things that are set up for private businesses, and they put up tents, and they're there. You have to leave by 11. But tents all over. All for example, over Union, Union Square, Square in the parks, Col yes. in the parks Columbus Circle. So that's okay. But, um, and I don't know what evidence was presented, because I wasn't in court the other day, about the so-called sanitation violations that were the basis of the state using its authority to come in. But in the end, they were enforcing private property interests. And that's really what the message, I think, from uh, the whole Occupy Wall Street's about. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Hopefully, um, Adonis Rodriguez will also be joining us, the New York City Council member who was arrested by police on Tuesday night when they evicted the Occupy Wall Street encampment. And right now, down at Wall Street, arrests have already started. Um, we will also get a report from there. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. Just like it's supposed to be, but we're not done purging the pervasive greed. Companies are kings of the century, and modern-day slavery assembles toys and factories overseas. A lot of sight, out of mind, but by choosing to be blind, you're just as guilty as the next guy. Make way, governments for the modern-day monarchy for the purposes of this game. Let's call it a corpocracy, though some fancy a democracy, the puppet boxing ring, it sells you another useless thing. <laughs> 
To cover up the garbage swirl, to clutter up this precious world, and hey, I'm just as guilty as the next girl. Sticks are playing with pepper campaigns to shell sound protrudes from the mountain range like a flag conquering land. We now colonize with our ads and our brands, and it clutters the open horizons of my youth. It looks two types of ways from two points of view. I humor you if you ask me to. Oh, let's contemplate the truth. make you remember. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Ryan Devereaux is on the phone with us right now, Democracy Now! reporter on the scene outside the New York Stock Exchange. Ryan, what's happening at this point? Uh, I made my way around the financial district, and uh, it looks like Occupy Wall Street protesters have blocked a number of intersections, uh, sort of with the help of the NYPD and their barricades. Uh, protesters have sat down in intersections, and right now I've returned to the intersection of Wall Street and Hanover, about two blocks or so east of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, about uh, two dozen protesters or so had linked arms across the street, forming a line across to the, uh, the police blockade. They started chanting, chanting this is a nonviolent protest, and then the police started shoving into them from behind as hard as they could and eventually broke through the line, knocking a number of protesters to the ground. Uh, the, the, the police then leapt onto the backs of the protesters. About three were arrested, and the, uh, blockade, the protester line was cleared out of the streets and has now been replaced by scores of police officers in uh, riot helmets. This is directly in front of the Deutsche Bank on Wall Street. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. We're talking to Ryan Devereaux right near Wall Street. And the plans for today, Karen Smith, a former uh, New York State Supreme Court judge, you have felt that the media has mischaracterized what the plans are for the protests, the mass protests today. Yes, particularly the statement that this, there were plans to take over the subways. There's never been plans to take over the subways. What the plan was for the afternoon session, I've been told and been and had meetings and about, so that I'm aware of it, is that they are planning to just have people give stories outside of subways, what they call soapboxes, on how the economics have affected them, and then to go into the subways and try to talk to the public on the subway trains on the way down to Foley Square later on as to how this economy has affected them personally to broaden the struggle and all and they have what they call hubs throughout the city there is no plan to and never has been to take over any subway I wanted to bring Stephen Graham into the discussion right now. Uh, we started speaking to him yesterday. Uh, he wrote the book Cities Under Siege, The New Military Urbanism, uh, just in from Britain uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, can you talk about, as we were just speaking with the former police chief, Norm Stamper of Seattle, and he oversaw the Battle of Seattle, how the police dealt with that, um, the militarization that we are seeing of police forces around our country? Yes, well, it's, um, it's a long-standing process that has its roots in um, policies against uh, drug use. It has its roots in the development of SWAT teams, spe special we weapons and tactics teams. And, uh, and it has its use in, in some of the responses to the 1960s disturbances across the West as well. And, and really, the, the, the effect of this, as, as we see in New York and elsewhere, is an increasing use of full-on riot squads, increasing use of um, non-lethal weapons, in, including things like um, acoustic systems that make it impossible for people to remain in spaces, including the pepper, pepper spray, including the tasers. And, and we have to remember this is a really big growth industry um, that military and security corporations are uh, investing heavily in terms of new research and development. If and, and Stephen Graham, what's the, the, the market? Uh, the, you're talking about a growth industry. What are we talking about here in terms of, of investment of dollars by, because there are so many, obviously, municipalities uh, in the United States with their sure. own police forces? Well, I mean, globally speaking, um, the, home, the so-called homeland security markets is, is a real, is in real boom town, boom time, excuse me. Um, I mean, it, in, a, in a world where actual defense contracts are often being reduced, a lot of the big companies are moving into civilian applications, 
moving into these non-lethal weapons, moving into um, all of the, the technologies of crowd control and, and civilian disturbance control. Um, and that has to be added to, of course, the much bigger markets that are growing in terms of broader questions of surveillance and security for buildings, for cities, for special events. Um, as we see these systems established more and more in terms of everyday spaces and everyday bits of, uh, bits of cities. So I haven't got figures to hand, I'm afraid, but it's, it's multi-billion dollar markets that are projected to grow globally um, at very, very high rates over the next 15 years, according to some of the recent market research uh, reports. Norm Stanford, if you're still on the line with us, former police chief of Seattle, does what Stephen Graham is saying uh, ring a bell for you? Does it resonate with your experience? Well, it, it certainly does. Uh, I might even add to that mix uh, the increased uh, privatization of uh, the prison industry in the United States, uh, where people are, in fact, making huge sums of money on the on the backs of those arrested for nonviolent drug offenses. And we're, we're talking really in the millions in this country. So I think there's that that needs to be considered as well. About the non-lethal uh, tools at the disposal of local law enforcement, many of those were developed in the wake of a controversial shooting. Uh, we understand a cop's got a dangerous job. It's delicate. It's demanding. Uh, there are situations that call for uh, life and death decision making, uh, oftentimes with no real time to contemplate uh, options and possibilities. Let's find non-lethal alternatives to that firearm. So the motive is good. The question is, to what extent are those non-lethal weapons being abused today? We have seen far too many examples of, of tasers, for example, used in situations where no force was necessary. It's just simply a way to get somebody to move faster or to get out of a car when they're passively resistant. So uh, it, it's important, I think, to understand the complexities of everything that we're talking about. For example, there are many compassionate, decent, competent police officers who do a terrific job day in and day out. There are others who are, quote, bad apples. What both of them have in common is that they occupy, as it were, a system, a structure that itself is rotten. And I am talking about the paramilitary bureaucracy. We're going to have to that. leave it there, Norm Stamper. But I thank you so much for being with us, uh, as well as Stephen Graham uh, and Chuck Wexler and Dorley Rainey and Karen Smith. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.